Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters, and key figures from the publishing industry, plus loads of hints, tips, and inspiration for all kinds of creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review, or just tell a friend. Right, cue that cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing. Grab yourself a drink, cause it's joined up writing. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can and sometimes does go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 108 with Paul Tudor Owen, author of the excellent New York based novel The Weighing of the Heart. Paul tells me about his long and bumpy road to publication and how his work as a journalist influences his writing. Very quick catch up from me, and it will be quick because there really isn't a lot to tell you at the moment.、Uh, my day job's been really busy, and I'm about to head off to Barcelona for five days to do some on site video editing. It sounds much more glamorous than it actually is, as what I'll actually be doing is spending most of my time in front of a computer screen trying to make a boring business conference look interesting. So wish me luck. And if I am lucky,、uh, you know, I might even get to look out of the window at some point. And if I'm really lucky, Or maybe disciplined is a better way to look at it. I'll also get some work done on the next draft of the sitcom I've been working on. John and I have been getting our heads around some recent feedback, and it's taken a couple of weeks for us to just let it settle in and decide on what needs to be done. Does anybody else find that with feedback? Sometimes it sort of feels like you have to ride the initial wave of emotion, let it all sink in, think it through in a more kind of objective way, and then decide how you want to proceed. I do think you have to look at it from all sides and resist the temptation to go with your, your knee jerk reaction because that reaction can be uh, resistance uh, to accept anything, there's anything wrong with it in the first place, but it can also be about jumping in just to change everything all at once. And if you're not careful, you can destroy the thing that made your scene or your chapter work in the first place. So, my advice is to take some time to really think about what the feedback might mean. It's something we touch on briefly in today's interview, actually, and I, and I make the point that sometimes the specifics of the feedback may not be exactly what's wrong with your piece, but it probably does mean that there's something wrong with it. So try to be objective, seek more than one lot of feedback, and try to look at it as a whole. But, you know, let me know how do you accept feedback? How do you give feedback?、Uh, how does it influence your work? Do you actually get your work out there before you start submitting it? Do you get some critique? Who are your trusted readers? Let me know by tweeting me at JU Podcast or tweeting me at Mr. Kelly to you. And you can also go on the Facebook page and all the other places. Anyway, let's get on to today's chat with Paul Tudor Owen. So, Paul is a respected journalist, having worked for The Guardian for 15 years, with three of those spent as their deputy head of US News in New York, time which greatly inspired and informed Paul's debut novel, The Weighing of the Heart. He also co wrote and co edited The Wire Re Up, a popular book about David Simon's classic HBO series. So, I'm already a fan of that.、Uh, and he grew up in Manchester and lives and works in London.、Um, the Weighing of the Heart is out right now, published by Friends of the Show, Obliterati Press, and available everywhere you can find good books. Okay, Paul, thanks a million for joining me on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. So, why don't we start off just by telling us whereabouts in the world you're speaking from and, and give us a sense of how things are going at the minute? Mm. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I'm, I'm really happy to be on the podcast.、Uh, I've listened to quite a few lately and、um, really enjoyed them.、Um, I'm in London.、Um, I、uh, was living in New York for the last,、um, from 2015 to 2018. And last year,、um, My girlfriend, who's now my, my wife, moved back. We moved back here. When we were in New York, I was working、um, at the Guardian in the New York office where there's about 50 people working. And now I've come back and I'm, 
I'm working again in um, the main Guardian office in in London. So my book, The Weighing of the Heart, came out in March, uh, published by um, Obliterati Press, who um, I think you've had on uh, the podcast before, um, Wayne Leeming and uh, Nathan O'Hagan. It came out in March and we had a book launch which went really well. So yeah, it's been a really, it's been a really, really exciting few weeks. Yeah, it's excellent. Well, you, obviously you mentioned the title and stuff, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about mm. the weighing of the heart? So, uh, tell us a little bit about w- what it's about. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, it's set in New York, and it's about a young British guy who moves in with a couple of rich old ladies. He's a lodger in there opulent apartment on the um on the upper east side near central park um he moves in there and he gets together with uh their other tenant who lives in an adjoining apartment and there are a number of priceless works of art on the wall and um together they steal one of the um artworks and it's an ancient egyptian scene and after they've stolen it, the stress of the theft starts to work on them, and the imagery, the ancient Egyptian imagery of from the scene starts to come to life around them, and it's unclear whether um, this is happening, this is really happening, or whether this is happening in the, in the narrator's head. Um, so that's a basic premise. Yeah, well, yeah, and it, and it is a great premise, so it's really original. Obviously, you mentioned there it's set in New York, and you also mentioned in the intro that you lived in New York for a while, but am I right in thinking that you started writing this before you'd even lived in New York? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, uh, I probably started writing it in about 2011, I think. And, um, so in a way I'd always been obsessed with, with New York for, for a long time since my, since my teens, since um, my university days when I studied um, American literature and American history. And I'd always wanted to live and work there. And in a way, writing the book was part of this sort of obsession and this fantasy that I had of, of living there. Um, so then... Um, when I had sort of nearly finished it, or I had a pretty good first draft I actually got a job in New York and so in that way life imitated art and um we went over there and it was quite a strange feeling because I was just working on I was working on the ending at that time and I was going to this um uh public library around the corner from our flat in East Village and um and it was a strange feeling that uh this fantasy that I had had about about a life in New York had had started to come true, um, and I was saying at the book launch, it was it reminded me of um, there was an episode of um, of uh, Red Dwarf, the the nineties <laughs> um, TV show, uh, an episode called Better Than Life, where Lister is stuck in this virtual reality computer game, a bit like The Matrix, mm-hmm. and. He doesn't realize he's he's in it, but it's basically his his greatest fantasy. And it's as if he's living in um, Bedford Falls, the town from Mm -hmm. It's a Wonderful Wonderful Life. Life, And uh, he loves it and he doesn't want to he doesn't want to leave. And um, sometimes walking down the street, these streets that I'd imagined living in for so long that I'd that I'd written about. And um, I was imagining, you know, was I better than life, too? Um, (laughs) (laughs) but I don't think I was. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, had you been to New York before you lived there as well? Have you got, had you actually got a sense of it or was it just, just yeah. yeah, you had, yeah. No, um, I, um, so for my, for my degree, uh, there was a year, there was a year abroad, there was a year in the US and I was studying for that year at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, so during that year, I made my first trip to New York with two friends of mine, uh, Heidi and Tony, and it was just an amazing, it was an amazing moment where you sort of feel like you are stepping into some of the the, the films that you loved, like Mean Streets and um, Taxi Driver, mm-hmm. or 
um, the books that you love set there, The Great Gatsby or um, Underworld by Don DeLillo. Um, I remember the um, the Greyhound bus coming coming down towards Manhattan um, early in the morning. We'd, we'd tra- travelled overnight in the Greyhound bus and um, Heidi sort of uh, nudging me to wake up because I had to see this skyline come into view and um, and it was just it was just brilliant it was a, it was an amazing feeling and I think I felt then you know that this was a such an inspiring city this was a place where people could do anything where creative people from all over the world um would would gather and a and a and a sort of culture would would emerge from them all being in such close proximity um so ever since that that weekend really um i had wanted to wanted to live there and i visited again while i was while i was in pittsburgh and then i came back and um i suppose then i i was really from like the mid 2000s i was trying to visit um, every year and different friends would go with me and and it was great and then there were a couple of opportunities with the Guardian uh, that didn't come off and by the time I did get this job I'd actually more or less given up given up hope of of this ever happening and I bought a flat in London and I felt like I was I was settling down and then suddenly this this opportunity came up and um, and so um, yeah we went uh, in 2015. And it all sort of came to life and came yeah, to fruition, exactly. all those dreams. Yeah. yeah. And did you find, because obviously you'd written the majority of the book by by then, and I know you'd visited a few times, but, you know, there's always this thing, it's, it's different, isn't it? Sort of visiting somewhere or going on holiday to a place than kind of living there. So did you find that, you know, after living there for a little while, did you find that certain elements, I don't mean the story necessarily, but did you find certain elements of the book in terms of the description or the atmosphere or the feel of it? Did you find yourself changing a lot of that stuff based on your experiences and things? Yeah, there were a few things. Um, there wasn't enough Brooklyn in the book at all. I think when I moved there, I suddenly realized as sort of embarrassingly late that um, the cultural center of gravity of, of New York had had moved to Brooklyn a long time before but my sort of um my sort of vision of new york the 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 um my fantasy of new york was, was eventually was essentially about manhattan um but i didn't um i didn't change the setting but i did change a few details you know there are there are moments where um or there are there are details like um artist studios that the characters have that um originally were in manhattan and you know when i got there it, it was quite quite clear there's no way that they would be able to afford that and i had to move that to another mm-hmm. another location so there there were a few things like that um there's a scene where i imagine that um at the top of the chrysler building there's a restaurant but actually in real life um strangely it's home to three or four dentist surgeries and <laughs> right. yeah and I um and I signed up to one of these dental surgeries and it was just brilliant sitting there in this seat uh dentist <laughs> chair looking at this amazing view it, was it just gives fantastic. you something to take your mind off that what's about to happen I suppose yeah they gave me six fillings they weren't impressed by <laughs> British dentistry <laughs> strange that yeah it's kind of one of the things we're, we're infamous for isn't it bad teeth <laughs> but actually um I, while I was there I started another book, which 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 is also set in New York, and in that one, the settings like range much further afield than I did in this in this book. For example, um, there's like a, a an important scene in in Red Hook, Brooklyn, which I think I'd never been to uh, at the time of writing the weighing the weighing of the heart, and then um, I definitely felt when I was coming to to write the new one. Um, that I had more of a grasp of the geography of the whole city rather than just um, Manhattan, which which the Weighing the Heart really focuses on. Yeah, you, you became, had more of sort of an insider's view, as you say, rather than just looking from the outside in. Yeah, exactly. So let's go back a little bit. So so tell me a little bit about your upbringing and your, your background. Where, where, are you, mm. where are you from originally? Because that doesn't sound like a London accent, if you don't mind <laughs> saying. <laughs> I'm from Manchester. Um, I grew up in Manchester, uh, 
really sort of um, a brilliant time to grow up in Manchester in the in the nineties. A um, lot of creativity there, a um, lot of music. Uh, mm-hmm. Very exciting time. Like big difference to London and and to New York was that um, I think all of these musicians you would you would see around you know you would see in the pubs your friends might go out with somebody from a band or or whatever like one of my friends lived next door to John Squire the the um mm. guitarist of the Stone Roses for example you know so these people were all really like knitted into the fabric of the of the city and it felt like a very exciting time to um to be there so I lived there till I left um, to go to university, went to Sheffield and um, studied American literature and American history and had that year at, at, at Pittsburgh. And then I um, wanted to train as a journalist um, and I came down to London and started off as a local newspaper reporter in um, northwest London for um, a group of papers, including the Kilburn Times. It's really like the um, all the, the the world that Zadie Smith describes. That was that was my patch: Kilburn, mm-hmm. Neasden, Harsden, Kingsbury, Queensbury, and I really got to know them. And um, that was a sort of fantastic job to have when you move to a city like London, because rather than just sort of getting up, getting on the tube, popping up in your office, coming home, you really get under the skin of of the city and um i think probably some of that gave me gave me confidence when i when i when i started writing fiction uh the fact that i was meeting so many different people from different walks of life i i think gave me gave me confidence when i was creating my characters um and then i um then i got a job at the guardian um Maybe in the mid mid two thousands, um, and I've worked there ever since. Probably, probably a lifer there now. Um, and then writing wise, fiction wise, um, I think I probably started. Uh, I started work on a on a novel um, when I was sort of in my early to mid twenties, and um, and I managed to get an agent at that point, and. Um, he was very encouraging and sent the book out, but it didn't really come to anything. Um, and then I wrote another one and it was kind of the same, the same thing really just nobody was biting, you know? Mm. Um, and then I think when I came to write, when I started the way of the heart, I just kind of knew that, um, I was onto something a bit better. Mm. And I especially thought that I, that I'd got quite a gripping first chapter quite quickly. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of sent it back to the, to the agent I was working with at that time. But it felt like, you know, uh, I mean, to look at it from his point of view, he probably felt that he'd uh, gone to quite a lot of work with these other two books and it hadn't really come to anything. But it was obvious that, you know, this book was not going to get anywhere with him. Mm-hmm. So I sort of parted ways with him and um, started looking for another agent at that point. And that was quite a um, that was quite an intimidating thing to do, really, because um, you're always told that it's absolutely very, very difficult to to get an agent in the first place, which it is. Mm -hmm. And the idea of going back to square one, you know, it was a scary thought, really. but I kind of had confidence in this, in the, the idea of this book. And I just thought, actually, maybe it's not going to be so hard now sending this book out as it was in my early 20s, sending out what's now, you know, probably juvenilia, really. So I did it. And the other thing that was re- a real difference was when I first tried to get an agent in my early 20s, I was doing it. I was doing it with you know, through the post. So I would every weekend print out like five copies of these two chapters, Mm -hmm. put them laboriously together, staple them, put them in envelopes. And that is so time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas when I, um, when I came to try and find another agent, uh, um, I guess this was uh, 2012 or 13, 
you know, the whole landscape had changed. I got hold of the Writers and Artists Yearbook and um, just blitzed it from starting at A, basically. And I probably sent, you know, sent it out 30 emails in one night, maybe got to about, you know, M in the alphabet and <laughs> it had a rest. And the response was much better. The response was immediately very encouraging mm. and that that felt great so then i um then i started working with one agent who was interested and um she was kind of she she wanted to push it in a direction that i wasn't very happy with so then i was faced with the same dilemma again you know do i do i go back to square one again but i just thought again look this is not it's not going to make me happy if i feel like I've had to turn it into something that I'm not proud of. Mm -hmm. So I cut ties with her and then I found um, the agents that I'm, I'm, I'm working with at the moment, who is um, Maggie Hanbury at the Hanbury agency. And I went to see her and her two assistants and that was just brilliant. Um, it was a great meeting. They, they really seemed to understand the book and what I was trying to do. Um, and that was, so that was fantastic. And then, um, uh, I guess just before I was about to move to, to, to New York, so the beginning of 2015, they had sent it out to a few publishers and a, a small publisher was interested. But um, uh, well, basically, this, the publisher really wanted um, the lead character. I'm not sure if this is giving anything away, but maybe I should just say she wants they wanted a, a big change. ending for the right. lead character. Yeah. Uh, it just seems and it was a complete, like a was very it heavy... A complete change to what you had in mind, basically. I had in mind a much more ambiguous ending, yeah. and she had in mind quite a sort of heavy-handed ending, yeah. in my view. Yeah. But I felt like, um, you know, I've... <laughs> Every time I'm getting closer and closer to this goal of having it published, but it's, you know, I'm not quite there. But at this point, I felt like I'm so close now. Can I, can I compromise? But um, I don't know if you found this with, with your writing, but sometimes when somebody raises a point, you go back and think about it. Mm. And actually, in the thinking through what they've said, you come up with another solution yeah and i did that and actually it didn't feel like a compromise it actually felt like it was i'd ended up maybe. improving yeah, yeah exactly i'd ended up improving it uh anyway by this time she'd lost interest <laughs> <laughs> however i was still pleased with the new ending i probably didn't do anything on the book then for another year mm -hmm. and then i went back to the agents and they were sort of their their point of view was that they had sent it out to a number of publishers and didn't feel able to just keep doing that indefinitely. Yeah. So I just said to them, "Look, I'm just going to send it out, you know, because it's sitting there in my desk drawer. Um, I th I think it's good, yeah. and nobody's reading it, and um, you know, what what's the worst that can happen? So I got the Right as an artist yearbook again, and the U.S. equivalent, um, which is called something like Writers Market or something like mm -hmm. that, and I just started going through them again from A and sending it out to all the small publishers, and it was a really interesting lesson I think because you're always told that um, you need an agent to get published, and I think for the big publishers, I think that's probably right. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not right for small publishers. I had a lot of responses. Lots of people wanted to read the whole thing. Lots of people got back to me. People gave me feedback. It was a good process. It was a very, very constructive process. And um, in the end, there were one or two interested, and it came together with Obliterati, which I'm really pleased about. They are great guys it's been a very good editing process um really get on well with them and uh and i really admire what they're doing you know s setting up um at their own risk basically mm -hmm. um 
for the love of of books and to try to get writers who wouldn't be um who wouldn't have a chance to be published a chance and I really respect that yeah it's been brilliant really to to see this ambition that I've had for so long finally come to fruition yeah absolutely and, and uh, I mean I've spoken to uh I'm trying to think now two or three I think three uh, different obliterati authors now and You've all kind of had similar stories. I don't. I don't mean your books are similar. I mean your 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 journey to publication has kind of right. been similar in the fact that you you've all kind of had a, a bumpy road in terms of finding the right home for it and going through a few trials and tribulations and and almost getting published and you know uh, people making or suggesting changes that you're not happy with or things that you compromise the story. So there's obviously a pattern there, and there's, it's great to hear that people that have had those kind of experiences and got those kind of books that maybe don't always necessarily fit into this nice little box somewhere that, mm. that, that obliterati are kind of, you know, offering a home for that kind of fiction. That's really good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so in terms of, so technically speaking, uh, the weighing of the heart is sort of your third novel, if you like, that you had to go <laughs> writing, which is kind of par for the course. When I speak to most people, it's, it's very rarely is it the first book. Um, so what do you think you said that you were quite young when you wrote those first two? What do you yeah. think, what do you think you learned from writing those first two books though? I just got be- better each time really. And I got better at, um, uh, the overall construction of the plot, um, I got better at establishing characters quickly. Um, I think I've always had a good ear for dialogue, um, so that was that was probably there. That was probably something that was there from from the beginning. Um, but I think uh, with the weighing of the heart, you can kind of look at the overall um, the overall structure and the mechanics of the plot, and I think it's much much tighter, and I think it works in a much more satisfying way. And I think that's something that that I, I was unable to do with those with those first two. I mean, the first one, I've incorporated some parts of it into the weighing of the heart. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I feel like um, that was actually it ended it ended up being being very constructive, really, because mm-hmm. um, some of those bits didn't didn't go to waste. Um, I don't but, think anything yeah. goes to waste, really. I mean, it, 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 you know, I mean, it's great that you could actually use some actual material from it, but the fact of the matter is, it's kind of a process, isn't it? And even if it's, you know, it kind of took you three books to kind of learn how to do it or to do it in a mm. way that you you were kind of happy with, so nothing's wasted, really. So, so, so from, one, from... one, one, of, one of the what? Sorry, if, if I just thought of one other thing. Actually, one other element was that. Um, I was writing in a very um, realist, naturalist mode for those first two books. Like very, like the second one was real sort of um, social realism, political kind of. Uh, it had you know strong political messages, and I've kind of um, moved away from that. Basically, I'm more interested now in um, uh, a bit of absurdity and um, ambiguity to. The narrative really i don't think i wouldn't say that the weighing of the heart is totally realism i think when you start it it seems like it's it's realism but i think it slightly moves away from that and and i think the one that i'm working on uh the one i'm working on at the moment also has that quality to it absolutely so so you when you were growing up and you and you were a kid and you were thinking i mean obviously you, you ended up doing a a university uh, degree that sort of had an element of literature to it and writing but was the yeah. plan always that you wanted to be a writer and, and if so where did that come from um yeah i it has been my ambition for a long long time since since childhood and i think when i was a child um i was sort of creating my own comics and my own stories and um it's something that I feel like I've always wanted to do. I can't remember when I started wanting to do that, but I do remember. Um, I remember that that experience of of going to America, going to Pittsburgh for that year. 
that was very formative because I really met a lot of people there who um, were very ambitious to succeed in various artistic fields, um, music, uh, acting, you know, and it felt like, um, well, it's that it's that cliche really of of um, of the American dream, and I I think that um, I did sort of take on some of that feeling that um, yes, you can do this, and not to be not to be put off or um, uh, not 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 to let anybody tell you this is an unrealistic ambition. And so I think that year in America was really important for for giving me that kind of self confidence. Um, and then um, I remember leaving university, talking to one of my lecturers and saying that I really wanted to be a, a writer. But I I recognised, you know, at that or I I already knew that that's not a way that you can really make a living. And so um, I sort of uh, swerved into journalism, really, which um, I thought would would have some of the same the same qualities and the same things I enjoy about writing fiction, I would get out of, of journalism. Um, and it was a, it was a bit like that. Um, although they're not probably as similar as I thought at the time. Mm -hmm. What? Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because I, I think probably a lot of people think would think, well, writing is writing, but so what, what are some of the, dis, the, the sort of differences and what, do you enjoy about your your day job your journalism and what are the differences between journalism and, and fiction for you in terms of writing i mean what i've what i've the side of journalism i've always been involved in is um is news reporting and now news editing so i think for, for the the main quality that you want a story to have a news story is that it's got to get um uh, information across to the reader as quickly and as clearly as possible, and that's completely different, really, to what you're trying to do when you when you write fiction. You know, some, sometimes when you're writing fiction, you actually might want to get uh, have the opposite effect. You know, you might want to withhold information from the reader. You might want them not to be clear about what exactly you're saying, and it becomes clear much later. You're trying to do other things. You're trying to do things with plot with character, with structure. Um, so some of those qualities, I think, could be found in like long form magazine journalism and creative nonfiction, as they call it in, in America. You know, they're, they're, those writers probably are wrestling with, with some of these same things. But I think for news journalism, you're not really. What, like your, your task is to get the information across to the reader as quickly as possible. Um, so in that sense, they're not, that similar, but I think that um, uh, some of the ways that it's really helped me having this journalistic background and training, um, like I was saying before, the, the ear for dialogue, I think um, it's really helped me having interviewed numerous people of different walks of life, different backgrounds, and tried to capture their idioms and their patterns of speech. I really used to enjoy doing that when I was a local newspaper reporter mm -hmm. so that really helped i think with 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 dialogue um and then i think the other thing is just um like the pace of work at work is really frenetic and i think that helps a lot when i sit down to write fiction you know i think I, i'm used to working at, at, at a very um hectic pace and i don't i don't get writer's block very often i can usually if I've got a difficult bit in the book, I can usually sort of get from A to B in a pretty sort of simple and bland, basic manner. But I'm not usually, and then come back and fix it later. Mm -hmm. I'm not usually sitting there, kind of staring blankly out the window, wishing this inspiration would come. I, I just sort of get on with get get to the next bit and 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 get on with that. And I think that comes from the kind of pressure that you're under in a newsroom. Absolutely. I was going to I was going to ask you that and you kind of partly answered it. But as regards to the process, because you don't have that luxury when you're at, at work, you, you can have a deadline and you've got to get the words in and you've got to submit your piece yeah. or whatever. <laughs> so in terms of how you you write your actual process, 
uh, uh, would you, do you tend to plot and outline things quite a lot or do you just go, you know, you've got a premise, you've got an idea or a character and off you go? Um, I think that um, once I've got the initial spark for an idea, it usually re- revolves around a, a, a scene. You know, I can usually see like an initial scene where some of the characters are involved and it kind of springs from there. So I think that, that I would normally start start with that. And then I kind of, um, I guess, gradually map out the plot until... It, I don't feel like I have to get all the way to the end, but I gradually just map out the plot in my mind and... I'm sort of keeping two documents going. One is the writing and the other one is um, a map of the of the plot. And then I think I usually then get to a point, maybe when I'm about halfway through, when I think, halfway through the writing, when I think, okay, I've got to, I've got to map this out to the end now because I need to know where all this is going and certain characters that I've put in certain places, uh, bits of foreshadowing, um, ideas that I've implanted, that I've planted in the, in the reader's mind. I need to figure out where they're all going and why I, (laughs) why I did that. And am I going to be able to pull all that stuff together in a satisfying way? And Doing the, the coming up with the ending, I think, is really the uh, for me is is the hardest the hardest bit. And um, with the weighing of the heart, I think I probably redrafted the final third. I don't know five or six times, maybe even more different different drafts, different different levels of ambiguity. Uh, I always had a I always had an idea of how how the last chapter would work, um, which I won't um, go into. But even, even that, I changed quite considerably in sort of the, the, the last draft or the penultimate draft or something. I suddenly, I suddenly changed that a lot. And um, I think it matters so much to the reader's overall experience of the book if you've managed to pull, pull all those threads together or not. Um, and it can be... It can be a very disappointing experience for the reader, I think, if an ending doesn't work. And I'm just in this new the, the new book that I'm working on now. The ending is again a real problem, and um, I've got a few friends, my wife and a few and a few friends who are like my trusted readers, mm-hmm. and um, three. My wife's read it, and two friends have read it, and out of the three of them two didn't like the ending and one did like it so i'm kind of in a i'm just <laughs> in a complete state of um of turmoil about it <laughs> but i think that what i need to do really is have a bit of space from it and then and then come back um and uh try and see the whole thing with fresh eyes really as you say often i mean like when you alluded to it with the uh the agent one of the agents that looked over uh, your book before and you know they had an issue with the end and they wanted it to end a certain way and, and you didn't Some sometimes I think with critique in general it is it's often a really really specific piece of critique is, is often not necessarily the thing that's actually wrong with it but the fact that the person has some issue with it even if they can't quite put their finger on it means that probably something's not quite right and it probably needs to change, even if it's not what they're exactly suggesting, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's definitely a good point. I mean, I think the thing with the ending is I obviously feel some dissatisfaction with, with, with how it is. I think if, if I thought it was brilliant and some, and some of the readers came back and said they didn't like it, but I still thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I I would keep it as it is, and I think there's obviously something niggling away at me that is why I want to change it. And you want it to be as good as it can be. Exactly. So what? Um, what yeah. What? What? So what would you say is the kind of most helpful piece of creative or inspirational advice that you've been given along the way with regards writing? The best advice for me 
which might not work for everybody is somebody I can't remember who at, at some stage said to me that you should go you should take the manuscript to a professional editing consultancy mm-hmm. and I did and it was it was a brilliant experience and it's expensive um but the guy that edited it um you know I mean he his report on the book was absolutely fantastic it was like a sort of um you know so, so somebody had d- done a really detailed like university essay analyzing uh-huh. the book and the way he described it the way he described what i was doing in the book or what i was trying to do he was better he was better at describing that than i than i was <laughs> at describing what i was trying to do myself yeah I mean, the problem with that is that might just be a unique experience that he is such a good editor. But um, but I do think um, it I mean, it, it helped me a lot. It really I think it really helped bring the book up to publishable standard. Uh-huh. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I think in previous eras, either your agent would do or when you when you are published, your publishers would do and i just don't think nowadays in most cases i think that both agents and publishers want to see the book you know perfect when it lands on their desk or as good as you can make it and i think the the days of it being a sort of rough diamond and then then taking 18 months to polish it i think are probably for most people over in your experience you feel like that, that that those days have passed sort of thing yeah. And and if you were starting out um fresh tomorrow, you know, say you were starting your writing career again in terms mm. of a novel or whatever, and you could give yourself what like one piece of advice or you could you do something differently, what do you think it would be? Well, it, it would have been a real relief to know that I was eventually going to get there because you spend all this time writing alone sending it out um you know there's so much silence in the process of sending a manuscript out to agents and publishers it it, it can be perfectly reasonable for someone not to come back to you for, for two or three months or ever and i think during that period um you know you can really feel like what am i doing here am i am i am i wasting all this creativity trying to do something um that is never going to get get me anywhere so you know if, if i could go back in time it would have been it would have been a really great help to know um that it would eventually <laughs> bear fruit but obviously that's impossible i think that one thing that i kind of realized fairly early in my early 20s i think was that um if you want to do this, you really are going to have to take time from your life to 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 actually knuckle down and do it immediately. And I remember I remember trying to figure out in my life what what I could cut out to make time for writing. And I think at that time it was like, um, well, watching tv in the evening socializing Mm -hmm. and i tried to sort of set myself a goal of writing one or two evenings a week and one day in the in the weekend and um i don't do that anymore i find it really hard to to write in the evening now but um one thing that i do do is um when i finished work I sometimes go to a um, uh, secluded part of the office and I just try and do then one or two hours of writing. And um, I'm still in a very, very productive mood from from working. Yeah, and that's a good so tip, actually, yeah. I just go straight into it. And also, you're not distracted. You're not trying to make something to eat for tea. You're not trying to... Um, you know, noticing that um, the clock has run out of battery and you need to replace it or you need to yeah. fix X, Y, and Z in All the fact, whatever. All distractions, yeah. Exactly. You just get down to it and then um, 
I mean, it depends what time you finish work, but I often do an early shift where I start work at about seven in the morning. And it means I'll finish, you know, by half past three or four o'clock. So then if I do two hours, it's still only six Mm -hmm. in the evening. So that's been a big help. And then sometimes, not very often, but at critical times in the writing of the book, take some time off work and just like have five days working on it. And I found that to be pretty crucial, really. Although it's in some ways a bit galling to use your holiday and not go away. Mm -hmm. It's been very, very productive for me. You've been able to just be intensely working on it sort of thing. Yeah, because, you know, when you're working, when you're working on it consistently, it's always there in your in your head yeah. and you spark new ideas much more easily you'll just be walking down the street and it will all be it'll all be present there so suddenly something will come to you something will, will flip into place and i think i've heard i've heard one of your guests talking about um the difficulty of holding the whole novel in your head at once and mm-hmm. i think if you're um if you are constantly doing something you know trying to do yeah yeah, if you're constantly in the world of the novel suddenly that's much easier and I think yeah if you can have some time off and and just really knuckle down to it that it it, it pays dividends really yeah well that's great advice so as we kind of wrap up why don't you just remind people where they can find uh, the weighing of the heart and uh, Mm. and also a little bit more information about you online yeah, sure. Well, um, uh, so it's The Weighing of the Heart, and my name's Paul Tudor Owen, and it's on Amazon. Um, it's on the Obliterati website, which is um, obliteratipress.com. Yeah. Um, it's now on the Waterstones um, website and the Foils website. And can people find you on Twitter? And have you got a website? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that? I'm on. Um, yeah, Twitter. It's Paul T Owen, and um, that's the same for Instagram. Well, that's great. Well, good luck. Uh, you know, as the book continues to roll out, and obviously, good luck on the the new book as well that you're writing at the moment. Great, thank you. Uh, but for now, thanks a million. It's been great to talk to you, Paul. No, great to talk to you. Thanks a lot for having me on. Yeah, thanks again to Paul. And do make sure you grab a copy of The Weighing of the Heart, which is out right now. I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That's it for this week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts from to have the show downloaded automatically every week. Also remember to get in touch with all your writing news, views, questions, or comments and tweet me at JUPodcast or at Mr. Kelly to you. And I'll give you a mention in a future show. So look out for the next episode when I'll be chatting to Dark Pines author Will Dean. But until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time. Joined up writing.